given that this is recorded, I'm okay with that. But any time, if you pull it up and listen to it at a later time, I want you to remember that the opening slide says February 22nd, because when you're given market outlook in today's world, by February 23rd, this may be outdated and of limited value. So it should be excellent on spot today, but by tomorrow, when oil goes to $120 a barrel, because we topple two or three more regimes and destroy the oil, you know, the, the reality of the world is those things can happen, and when they do, it comes back to rock commodity prices, corn, milk, wheat, just as much as it does energy. And so, uh, literally, we can change things overnight fairly quickly. See if I get the right, no, that's not the right button. There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> just to start off with the general uh, big picture, look at what grains are on uh, that we have our ending stocks right now. You can see the, the blue line here, the blue bars represent the coarse grains, primarily corn. It's the only one where world ending stocks are fairly restrictive. The others, uh, the world ending stocks in terms of wheat and soybeans aren't that restrictive in terms of world picture. Uh, coarse grains are, uh, so keep that in mind uh, worldwide. But let's look closer then at the corn stocks. Uh, the corn market, we'll start off with that one <clears throat> as kind of the dominant feed grain. You can see uh, basically sorghum, barley, and oats. Uh, they essentially follow along with whatever corn is doing uh, in the market. Well, to start with, look at corn yield over time. Uh, we've had since the uh, mid-1980s, 2.2 uh, bushel uh, per year annual increase. Obviously, variability uh, around that because of, of weather. But one of the things I want you to point out is that the yield that they're projecting for the 2011 crop <coughs> will be the second biggest yield ever. Uh, it's projected on trend line, but it'll still be the second largest yield ever. Uh, and so keep that in mind that we're projecting that kind of yield. We're also then, with the acres that they're hoping gets planted in 2011, they're actually projecting that the 2011 crop will be the largest crop uh, of corn. And if you'll notice there, we're getting up to about a 13 and a half uh, billion bushel corn crop. Incredible to think about when back here just a few years ago, uh, a 10 billion bushel crop was considered a monster crop, and now we're projecting 13 and a half billion bushel crop. Well, it's a good thing we have that crop. If we look at the, the uses of corn, uh, this is the, the feed usage. You can see it's dropped off quite a little in the last few years, but this doesn't really uh, depict the true picture. Corn equivalent feed uses has probably dropped, but more in this range here, if you threw back in the uh, byproducts from the ethanol industry, the dried distillers, grains, the wet corn gluten feed that comes out of that process. So if you factor that those are getting fed back into the industry, uh, our corn feeding equivalence is probably more there at the five and a half billion. But actual corn going into the feeding industry, cattle, hogs, dairy, poultry, et cetera, down here just over five billion bushels <coughs> expected to go into the feeding industry. Our exports demands been variable over time. You look at that, uh, they're projected to be lower in 2011, primarily because we won't have enough corn if we ship as much export, if we export as much as we did in 2009 and 10. That's really the only rationale for USDA lowering corn exports is that we don't have enough corn. Because if you look at what's going on with the, the strength of the US dollar, uh, the weakening of the dollar, the, the world economies, the world corn situation. When you look at what, I'll show you what's happening with wheat exports, everything should say we ought to be ex exporting more corn, but the reason the government is showing us less is they'd run out of corn if they didn't predict less. And so uh, it probably will be less. It'll probably be price that, that tends to ration that and not necessarily uh, because there's less of a, a demand for it. <clears throat> well, the big uh, impact on the corn market that has been now for the last five or six years is the ethanol industry. This is total food, alcohol, and industrial use, but it's being dominated. All this growth is the, the ethanol that's, that's being mandated in, in the 
marketplace. And really going back, uh, clear back here in the 70s and early 80s, we had subsidies in place for ethanol and we had tariffs on Brazilian ethanol back in this time frame, but it wasn't until uh, around 2005 that we introduced the first legislation that mandated that uh, our fuel uh, blenders had to use a certain amount of, of ethanol in their product and then we upped that requirement in 2007. And so you can see the increase, uh, so this is 2010, the, the current crop year, um, <clears throat> be over 6 billion bushels of corn will go into that, uh, into that usage and it will continue to grow. As we look at the, the standards here, these were the ones that were set and you can see right now we are this uh, year we're at 12.6 which will be up a little from uh, last year and then it goes up again and so it continues to increase in terms of the required corn ethanol usage. This conventional is, is basically corn ethanol use and the other thing that's a little worrisome right now, the science on these advanced biofuels really isn't where they hoped it would be in terms of there really aren't many other products that are anywhere close to being economically feasible right now and so <clears throat> to try to meet this total renewable fuel standard mandate, the industry, the corn industry is trying to lobby that uh, corn ethanol can substitute for this. So you can see as we, as we move forward over the next two or three years, that's increasing dramatically as well. So until we change this policy, we're going to continue to see uh, an increased demand for that corn and it's going to strain all the, the production resources in terms of meeting this, this fuel need and still providing enough food and, and uh, feed for the different industries. Just to kind of see that in one graph, uh, feed and, and residual used to dominate the, the corn market. The food, seed and industrial was a fairly small part and then you can see the growth in the last couple years and as I mentioned now, it is the largest component uh, of the corn demand uh, exceeding the, the feed usage. You can also see that here on this one. This separates out the ethanol from the other uh, industrial uses, but you can see the growth in ethanol, the decrease in feed, and again, even just ethanol in and of itself in about one more year will surpass the uh, feed usage uh, and that's excluding the other uses of corn industrial wise. Well, the big concern driving corn market right now is our ending stocks. This is U.S. ending stocks. We're down now uh, projected to be about uh, I think 700 billion bushels, million bushels at the end of this year, uh, this crop year which will end in, in September. Next year they're projecting a slight uptick in that. Uh, that again, let me show it to you this way. This is ending stocks as a percent of total use, which they're now down under 5%. So if you remember those first couple of slides, we're projecting, the, or the USDA is projecting record corn yields, close to record corn yields, and record corn production. And yet with that, with those projections, and they're also projecting exports to be lower than they've been the last two or three years, with those rosy, oh, back up, with those rosy export or production uh, estimates and declining exports, we're still only going to have roughly 5% of our usage left over at the end of the year. And so that's what's, that's what's driving the corn market right now. Uh, basically what that says is if yield or acres or some combination decreases only 5% from the projection, then uh, we'd be out of corn. Now again, we won't physically run out of corn. The price in the market will, will ration that, but this is the big concern right now and why you're seeing the upward uh, price swing in, in the corn market is the, the market is basically trying to bid enough acres away from other co crops, uh, cotton, uh, soybeans, some spring wheats, to try to ensure that we have enough, enough corn. And my concern is if you look at this winter, it looks very similar to a winter a few years ago when that spring we had a lot of delayed plantings, we had a lot of flooding in the Midwest 
and I think we're setting up, it appears the same scenario. And so, if you start to see uh, reports of extensive flooding or delayed plantings, that corn market could get even more wild because essentially we'd be running out of corn based on their projections. So here's the, the futures market where corn has gone uh, since last October, uh, moving up. We're priced now on the, the current nearby futures over $7. This is slides a couple of weeks old, so I think March futures last uh, yesterday's close was 705 or 708, somewhere in there. So it's above the $7 range. You can see we're kind of following this same pattern that we did in 2008-9 when we had a uh, a big jump in the corn usage, the ethanol usage, and there was concern that we wouldn't get enough acres planted. And I think we could follow that same trend, only we're already uh, a dollar higher than we were a year ago. If you look at kind of where the futures are, uh, these are not the exact closes from yesterday. That's kind of taking uh, the last 10 days or so uh, average. But you can see uh, corn's projected to, to be uh, fairly expensive through the rest of this uh, winter and into the early spring, uh, summer. If we get <coughs> the corn crop planted and if it's a good growing season, then I think there's a potential to drop back to these prices where the futures market has it pegged. I would say if we have any problems with uh, planting, we don't get the acres in, or if there's inter any problems throughout the growing season, lack of moisture, uh, heat at the wrong time or, or not enough heat, whatever it is that would reduce yield potential, then I would say that we could quickly uh, change this from being a dollar discount to even a dollar uh, premium to these as they then try to ration that next, next crop year. So that's where the market is presently. Uh, again, uh, and, and I would say if there's a risk of these moving, it's probably more likely to move higher than lower uh, given our current scenario. So just to summarize then the corn market, we're projecting record yield, uh, record crop. The mandated ethanol use is going to continue, so we're not going to run out of, of demand or users for that crop. And basically anything short of that record crop will probably result in, in even higher prices. Locally, in terms of if you're a corn user, uh, you're wanting to look for opportunities to buy corn at a, at a cheaper price. We're probably going to be in the $6.50 to $8 uh, per bushel range for the next several months on 100 weight. That's somewhere in the $11.50 to $14.25. So I'd say any time that it's approaching those lower ends uh, would be opportunities to buy. Uh, and as it approaches those upper ends, if you're a corn grower, opportunities to sell. Okay, just a couple charts on barley. Uh, you may not be able to see those numbers very far back in the room. Just pointing out here, this is hard. Uh, planted acres, and you can see that the projection is uh, from two years ago we were at 4.2 million acres. Last year we dropped to 3.6. They're projecting for this year that we'll be down at 2.9. Again, that's just the trend of corn basically stealing acres from other uh, commodities, uh, the, the grains, the small grains. The, the cotton, the, the soybeans, there's battles going on for that. So barley will probably be in a fairly short supply. Uh, they also show then uh, production decreasing. If we look at, at kind of what's happened with barley prices, again, following along with the same thing going on with corn, we've had a uh, pretty significant uptick in the market in the last uh, three or four months on, on barley prices. Utah prices, if you kind of look at where they're priced at, they're in the $10 per hundred weight range right now, probably going to vary between 9 and 11, depending upon where corn goes. Uh, if corn goes lower, it'll push down towards the 9. If it goes higher, it'll be up in the $11 range. On the food grains, if we look at wheat, uh, take a look at what's going on in that market. This is total planted acres of, of hard red winter wheats. Basically, this big decrease that came back here was primarily driven by trying to get wheat, intentionally getting wheat out of production. Uh, if you remember back in this time frame here, we essentially had uh, a year's supply of wheat in storage, and, and that was keeping prices very low. And so the CRP and other programs were designed to try to reduce that acres. And then you can see, basically, in the 2000s, uh, we varied up and down. But maintained fairly stable on, on wheat acres in the last 
several years. If you look at total wheat planted acres, though, that kind of tends, that looks like it's continuing to decline. And I would say this drop off here, again, is related to the corn industry taking acres away from the other uh, soft white wheat, spring wheat acres. So anywhere where corn, uh, where you can get enough heat units, growing degree days to grow corn over wheat, they're probably doing some switching away from the wheat, and that's showing that uh, decrease in wheat. So one of the things going on is we are planting less total acres of wheat, but just like the corn market, we have had increases in wheat yields over time. They haven't been as dramatic in terms of a percentage basis or a yield basis as compared to corn, but they are continuing to increase. I mean, if, and if you think about that, in 30 years, 35 years, we've had uh, about a 50% increase in wheat yields. So again, it's, it's a lot less on a per bushel basis as compared to corn and percentage, but it's still a significant increase and has helped us uh, maintain adequate uh, production. And in some cases, we'd probably say helped us maintain too much uh, wheat production. So if you look at then where wheat, the U.S. wheat production scheduled for next year to be about even with the present year. So this is, again, taking in wheat yields. Uh, there is some concern that the present winter wheat crop in some of the northern Great Plains uh, wasn't, uh, didn't get as off to as good a start. It's had pretty good winter moisture. So uh, a friend of mine from back in Kansas used to say that the, the winter wheat crop in Kansas usually uh, dies two or three times before it hits the bumper crop the next, next summer. So uh, <clears throat> you have to take that with some grain of salt. I would say there's probably been adequate moisture that will come up with a sufficient winter wheat crop. Total wheat usage then, uh, this is U.S. wheat usage, so it includes primarily our food use and a little bit of feed usage here. Uh, we're going to be using just over a billion bushels. Go back, remember we're, we're planning on uh, producing a 2.2 billion bushel crop, so we'll use domestically uh, just over uh, a billion bushels. And then if we look at where the export projections are, uh, and again, this is where I find it interesting, wheat exports uh, projected to be way up because of some of the uh, problems in, in the rest of the world. Russia had a very bad wheat yield uh, wheat crop this past year. Australia ha is having uh, problems with its current crop, uh, and, and so we're, we're projecting big uh, wheat exports uh, at the same time that we're projecting lower corn exports according to the government. But anyway, we'll use up most of the wheat crop. If we look then at our ending stocks, they'll be lower than they were a year ago, but not nearly as restrictive as the corn market in terms of when you look at that wheat ending stocks, not overly restrictive. Most of the price uh, price improvement on wheat isn't necessarily because we're worried about running out of wheat right now. It's having to do with where corn is and that strong export market. Those are the two things kind of driving the, the wheat market higher right now. And again, this is one where who knows what's going on. I mean, uh, a lot of our wheat going into the Middle East, and as those regimes become more unstable, those people will still need to eat, but it's questionable whether the, the distribution will remain uh, constant that we could actually get the product into there. So I think there's a little concern in the wheat market uh, as we see that uh, additional uncertainty in those markets. You can see exports over the last four or five years have trended a little higher over time. Uh, and when we look at the, the current year, we'll see that, uh, that trend increasing. That's representative. I mean, that's good news for the wheat producers in terms of uh, basically that's showing that we're gaining a little more market share uh, all the time vis-a-vis -vis Europe, uh, Australia, uh, and those countries. So as, as we do that, uh, you know, maybe that's also reflective of a weaker U.S. dollar that's allowing us to, to move more product at a competitive price. Just a couple of notes from a friend of mine from Kansas State who knows far more about the wheat market than I do, so I just borrowed a couple of his recent slides on Outlook. World ending stocks, he points out where they are, that they, relative to the last two or three years, again, the world ending stocks, not that restrictive. 
but he points out the problems uh, with uh, the Australian Canada uh, wheat in 2010. Uh, certainly the Russia story was well known in terms of uh, their, their problems. And so he points out that, that our, our exports, uh, because of these problems, probably be uh, fairly uh, robust throughout this, this marketing year. On the U.S. supply uh, side, again, he points that our, our current uh, projected, this MY is marketing year, so the 2010-11 marketing year uh, projected at 818 million bushels. Relative to the last couple of years, uh, not near as low as we were two or three years ago when we saw, uh, this is when we saw wheat uh, jump up to $12 a bushel, so we're not in that, that range, but certainly uh, down from a year ago, and it's given us some some ongoing uh, upward price mobility in that market. Again, he talks a little about the, the weather problems in, in this past fall uh, in terms of the hard red winter wheat uh, seedings. I think the, the winter moisture has been pretty good through most of that area, so we'll probably be okay uh, with that wheat, wheat price. So looking at where Kansas City Board of Trade wheat has wheat market price right now. We're basically in the $9, uh, 9.50 range. Uh, the current, the, the winter wheat crop that's in the ground or the spring wheat that you'll be planting here in the next month, if the snow leaves, uh, this is the prices that you'll be looking at for there. Our price for number 12% protein wheat has trended about a buck 20 to a buck 40 below that uh, Kansas City board price the last year and a half. Uh, and again, that's something to, to be aware of. If you go back three or four years, we were uh, 40, 50 cents below this price. Then we went to 70 cents below that. We're now trending, like I say, a buck 20, buck 40 below that. Uh, so keep that in mind if you're looking to this uh, to gauge where your wheat price may be. So these are kind of the, the current price projections I'd have based on where the futures market is projecting that. All right, if we move to, to hay supply then, uh, or the hay market, and we'll start off with, with hay supply. Our, our hay stocks are down from the last three or four years. They're not as low as they were in 2006, but relative to the last several years, a fairly tight December 1 uh, stock of, of all hay in the U.S. If we look at Utah versus the U.S., this is the, the same. The big bars are the U.S. ending stocks. Again, you can see that they're down from the prior three years, not quite as restrictive of 2006. But Utah's stocks, these smaller bars, and they're on this axis here, Utah stocks lower than they've been in the last four or five years. So uh, our, our local market, fairly tight supply as of December 1. If we look at the projections for where it'll be May 1st. This is the, the May 1st projection and then a projection for a year from now uh, for the total U.S. hay stocks. So again, you can see uh, projections that are, they'll be lower. And as we start to get projections out here for the 2012 ending stocks, you can see we're really getting then to a fairly tight hay supply nationally uh, that will be projected out there unless we have some uh, really bumper yield. And part of that, again, and I'm not sure I've got the slide that shows that. Actually, I do have some slides that show we're probably taking some hay acres out of production and going into the grains just because you can make more money on a per acre basis on grains than, than hay right now with current price levels. So that's kind of what that's reflecting is that we're, we'll be losing acres uh, and therefore losing production. All that uh, signals that hay prices should keep moving higher. In terms of May 1 stocks, don't have the data uh, projection for Utah, but they are likely to be fairly tight. Everybody that I talk to basically says there's uh, what hay is still in sheds, is sold, is tied up, and that will be a uh, fairly tight supply uh, in Utah, probably down in here, uh, narrower than what we were at May 2007, uh, will be fairly fairly tight on hay supplies. This is uh, our Utah alfalfa hay production for the last uh, five years and then the projection for this year. We're projecting that we'll be down uh, about 10,000 uh, <clears throat> acres. Some of that again will be going switching into some of the grains uh, both 
uh, some wheats and corn, barley, uh, all of them when you price them out on a per acre basis on, on profitability looks like they're more profitable than alfalfa and so we're probably going to switch that out a little bit. If we use uh, the average yield from the last five years as a projection, then our production will be about equal with last year but down from the prior five years uh, production. So not looking at a, a bumper crop in any uh, indication. So if we're starting with a fairly tight supply in May and we're having a fairly small crop, uh, that would signal that we'll have a, a fairly uh, small uh, total supply of hay going forward. The national picture is very much the same. Uh, nationally they're projecting a little more than, uh, well about 14 million uh, well, if this is in millions, then we're looking at uh, 140,000 acres uh, coming out of uh, alfalfa production and again, probably going into corn most likely or some other grains, again using kind of the five-year average yield for a projection on yield, then we're looking at uh, basically the smallest alfalfa crop that we've had in the last five years. So <coughs> total supply. Uh, nationally of alfalfa is projected to be uh, the lowest crop in, in the recent time frame. All hay, uh, most of our meadow hay, our, our native grasses, we pretty much don't take in and out of production. So this just represents the alfalfa that's come out of project production. <laughs> Again, using the average yield, we'd be looking at uh, a fairly small supply of al our total hay relative to, to the past five years and nationally is the same type of trend. Again, these are projections uh, from the USDA on acres and then using that average yield. You can see again when we look at the total hay market, uh, only you had to go back to 2006 to find a smaller uh, total hay crop than what is being projected out here. So hay supply will likely be uh, fairly limiting, uh, which will give some upside potential for that hay market. So just to summarize our current stocks, uh, are lower, they're not to the point of, of price rationing yet, but certainly uh, they're giving some upward price mobility to the marketplace. When we look at uh, the 2011 projections, uh, a fairly small hay crop relative to the last five years, and so as we look to 2011, uh, our hay supply will be down. If we look at the, the hay users, uh, the demand for hay, uh, well, in Utah, it's primarily the dairy industry that drives that. Won't really talk much about the cubers. Uh, I'll mention a couple things on hay export. Total hay supply here, the blue bars, green bars disappearance. Again, if we look at 2011 disappearance, looks like it's projected to be slightly above 2010. So if we've got uh, a slightly smaller crop in 2011, slightly more usage, we'll end up with an even tighter supply which will start to get to the point where we'll likely see uh, some price rationing occurring uh, maybe towards the end of 2011. If we look at cow numbers, dairy cow numbers declined uh, fairly significantly in 2009, 2010, those numbers stayed more constant. This is uh, national numbers. Utah numbers followed similar trends but not quite as drastic in the herd calling in 2009, but our numbers are down a little bit relative to the last several years. The milk feed price ratio, uh, 2009, uh, disastrous year for the dairies in terms of their profitability. Uh, 2010, a little better as we start 2011. Uh, you can again see what that higher price grain primarily, the higher price corn, soybean meal is doing to that milk feed price ratio. Has it back down under $2 uh, or under, uh, that should be sort of prices, that's a, a ratio, so it's back under 2, uh, which again probably uh, is not uh, signaling a whole lot of profitability in the dairy industry. If we look at dairy milk futures, there is some optimism in the market. I think if, if we realize these prices, if we are selling milk in the $17, $18 per hundred weight, that'll probably bring that ratio back up to where uh, maybe we can be making a little money uh, in the dairy industry. Um, and, and if they can make a little money, uh, that'll help in terms of, of the hay price. If, if these 
prices aren't realized, if we start to see these prices uh, slip back into the uh, $14, $15 range uh, where they were a year ago, then they'll be in trouble given the current grain price. And again, they'll have a hard time paying up for hay even if hay is, is short. And so that'll put a, a damper on, particularly locally, uh, how, how high hay prices may go here locally. The beef industry uh, doesn't really set the alfalfa hay price, but usually provides a, an underlying support. Total beef numbers have been declining, but one of the things that's going on is we're trying to feed more calves outside of the feedlot. And so as we do that, we're probably putting more hay and less grain into them. So I think total hay usage in the beef industry probably be fairly constant uh, this year as compared to last year. And if you look at uh, feeder cattle futures, and I actually pulled this one uh, slide about 10 days ago, all these prices are about two or three dollars higher than that right now. Most of them are priced uh, 130, 131, uh, even some 132s out here, uh, which would signify uh, locally selling 500 pound calves for buck 40 somewhere in there, which would be record level uh, calf prices. So profitability in the beef industry should be uh, pretty significant. And so at least uh, underlying that hay market and if there's uh, people wanting to feed some calves to add some more weight before they go to the feed lot, they'll certainly have the uh, dollars or should have uh, to pay a little more for hay. So I'd say the, the beef industry would be supportive of higher hay prices, even though, like I say, they're not the ones that are usually uh, setting that market or driving it. Looking at total uh, animal consuming units uh, and then our hay supply relative to that, even though cow numbers, uh, dairy and beef, have been declining, our hay supplies are getting tighter. And so when you look at the 2011 projection, we're actually showing that that has decreased over a year ago. So with our tighter hay supply that's projected out there, we'll have less total hay available for or per animal uh, feed consuming unit. So again, this will start to, to generate uh, opportunities for, my, for some upward prices. Uh, you can look back here over time and find uh, a couple years when it was even tighter, but relative to, to kind of the last 10 years, we are at a fairly tight supply of hay for the size of the, of the cattle industry. Export market then, 2009 uh, had a, a big jump in alfalfa hay exports. 2010 backed off a little from that, but still uh, very good exports of alfalfa hay into the market. Other hay uh, actually increased. So when we look at the total hay export market, very strong hay exports are two major markets. Japan uh, was down a little in 2010 relative to 2009, but still relative to kind of their last uh, four years, pretty significant production. The big uh, jump in the market, uh, 2009, was the uh, hay going into the United Arab Emirates. And you can see that in 2010, that backed off a little bit. There's probably some competition from some other countries that realized that that was a, a growing market and probably started to step in there and compete with us a little for that. But given that we've got two years now of data that shows they're, they're uh, exporting or importing a lot of hay into the United Arab Emirates, that's probably going to be back up. That's probably going to be our number two market going forward. They are trying to develop a, a dairy industry in there and they're essentially having to uh, import most of their feed to support that domestic dairy industry. So summarize on the demand, dairy cow numbers will be up a little in 2011. Profitability probably going to be improved a little from 2010, certainly uh, improved from 2009. And if the current futures markets will hold, if those prices will hold through the year, then I would say uh, have a little bit more profitability in that industry. Certainly the beef uh, industry is looking at improved profitability. Uh, those things will be positive in terms of hay prices. Exports were down slightly in 2010, but it looks like they're going to stay fairly positive in, in 2011. Uh, everything in terms of our strength of our dollar uh, is, is supportive of a positive export market again. What does that say for hay prices? Nationally, we've seen a little bit of uptick. 
uh, in the last couple of months. Not a lot really on the national uh, alfalfa hay price. If we look at uh, Utah alfalfa hay prices, these are prices as uh, listed by the USDA NAS report. Uh, and, and so uh, the current report, the last report, shows us in the kind of the 100 to 120 dollar range. As I talk with people about where that market really might be, we're probably more likely, if I, if I keep the bars down where the USDA NAS may be reporting prices, I'd kind of use that projection. If I keep the prices based on where I've heard the market trading, we're probably more likely in this area where we're moving up into that 150, 160 uh, dollar a ton range. I would say if, if the uh, milk price moves higher, uh, you'll probably see some upward pressure there, um, top end, uh, getting up. Uh, we might even see some $180 a ton hay, uh, and again, depending upon the size of the crop. So I think we're definitely uh, moving higher than we were the last couple of years. I'm not for sure we'll duplicate the prices of 2008, but at the top end, we could be close to that again in 2010. And one of the challenges, and I know there's some dairy guys sitting in here, uh, you, you know, they see a little hope out there on the milk front in terms of prices, and then they see uh, corn at uh, 12, 13, 14 dollars a hundred weight, and they're starting to look at alfalfa at 160, 180, and again, that takes kind of the, uh, the fun out of milking cows if, if these prices are, are realized. All right, I think I've about used up my time, and uh, certainly exceeded my knowledge, so I'll try to answer any questions that you might have.